All right, everybody. Welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie, and I want to thank everybody for being here for today's very important presentation. What are we going to be discussing tonight? Well, we are going to be discussing the geology of Mars with SFT team members, Professor David McQueen and George Bond, or I should say Batman and Robin with myself being Alfred. Um, and I say that proudly. So <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Professor McQueen, George. I like it. I like it. How you doing, brothers? We are uh, doing good. well. Good to hear. Good to hear. Well, we've already got a great chat. Uh, like I said, people are excited for this, uh, George and Professor McQueen. You guys always bring great presentations. You do fantastic research. I'm extremely excited for this. Before we get right into it, though, I do want to give a couple reminders um, and I actually see Jackson Rowe in, in the chat. So Jackson, good to see you. Uh, Jackson Rowe will be back here with us. I believe it's the 17th. Make sure you guys check the event section with Professor David McQueen. They are going to be debating Noah's Ark and Noah's Flood, fact or fiction. So that is going to be a ton of fun. Again, we've got um, Sam Jenkins and Joseph Hubbard who are going to be here this week on Thursday. We've got a sneak peek for you. we got a little surprise pertaining to the short film that we, Standing for Truth Ministries and uh, Creation Research, have uh, teamed up for. Uh, so we've uh, kind of partnered on this short film, Genesis, Experience Creation from the beginning. So please, if you're not yet subscribed to their podcast, their YouTube channel, and also check out their website, uh, the Creation Research Team. So that being said, again, uh, David, George, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to hand it over to you guys. How are you guys doing tonight? And what's the topic exactly? Well, to, tonight's topic, and the bat symbol is up in the air. And so we uh, can get started I want to remind Jackson that, uh, as I've done with others I've debated, you send Donnie your mailing address, and I will mail you a inscribed and autographed copy of my book as a way of saying thank you for the debate. Um, George, uh, how have you enjoyed your freedom in Eastern Australia? Uh, yeah, not complete freedom because... Um... I, I can't sit down and eat in a restaurant because I'm not double vaccinated. Oh, be careful with that word, George. I mean, oops. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No, but uh, just to keep a, a, a promise to John McKay, McKay, um, and it's appropriate uh, actually at, at this time because the um, COP26 uh, climate change issue was. Uh, in everyone's uh, ears and eyes, uh, I recommend if you do have the time and a very little bit of money, there's a great video that um, uh, Creation Research have put out. It's called Fire and Ice. Watch it and you'll see why climate change isn't what it's made out to be. Okay, that's all I'll say. So I hope I hope that's okay with you, John. Uh, I, I did promise I'll I'll take you up on it and let everyone know. Yeah, and that's uh, and that's good, Jackson. I want to acknowledge uh, the fact that I see you in the chat, and we'll look forward to our debate uh, soon. We want to uh, to begin tonight with some light-hearted things, as we usually do. Here is a Martian from my comic book collection in 1963. And notice that this Martian has got all three of us captured here. It's got Donnie, <laughs> Superman. It's got uh, Batman and Robin. And notice what it says there. The, the rays from this Martian are overcoming and becoming like kryptonite and so forth. And so we can have some fun with the Batman and Robin side of things. I was very troubled when Donnie and I went to the Standing for Truth Halloween party. <laughs> and we found George dressed up like Wonder Woman. It was, it was, it was troubling, but we still had some fun there. Uh, now, uh, I look good. I look good. Yes, you do look good. 
You rocked um, it pretty good, George. I'll give you that. The, uh, <laughs> the, the point of our uh, time tonight, and uh, I'm setting my timer now for um, for five minutes to give a five-minute introduction on, on my end. Our topic tonight is illustrated by these two models that we have used in our teaching in the past. It's the difference between Earth and Mars, if I can get them centered here. And you see Mars and and Earth uh, there in the in the view. And so we're going to ask the question, how come everybody talks about local floods on Mars? And yet when we get to the Earth, everybody gets really uh, bent out of shape when talking about uh, a global flood. Well, you might see an analogy here. In my research over the last couple of weeks with George's help, there aren't that many people that talk about a worldwide flood on Mars, although they claim that creationists are nuts for talking about a worldwide flood on the Earth here. Uh, They won't always attribute it to local floods. But... Remember that one of our areas of focus is always how do we bring the topic of Mars? And you'll see the red planet behind me here on the poster that I picked up uh, this week. And as I bring it closer and closer, you can see the polar ice caps and so forth. Well, in antiquity, it was observed that there were wandering stars And those wandering stars we now know are planets. And so where do we find in the Bible a discussion of Mars at all? Well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn back with me to uh, the fourth day of creation, which is Genesis chapter 1, beginning with verse 14. And let's read and see what we can learn. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven, to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And so it goes on to talk about the greater light that rules the day. And that is the sun and the lesser light that rules the night. And that would be the moon. We're obviously in the next year going to be talking about many topics about the earth and the moon. We're going to take up the topic of how the moon's mineralogy and geology shows it to be not having evolved from uh, the earth. But tonight is our topic. uh, Our topic is Mars. Now, where do we find it in this, uh, uh, in this account in Genesis? So let me keep on reading. In verse 15, it says, Let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. Now, remember that my viewpoint and the viewpoint of standing for truth is that the days of Genesis are consecutive solar days. They are ordinary days. Why must that be true? If they're to be an example to us of six days of work and one day of rest, they have to be real days. And so they are real days. And so on the fourth day, it says this, And God made two great lots, the greater lot to rule the day, and the lesser lot to rule the night. And then this is the David McQueen translation. And oh, by the way, as an afterthought, he made the stars also. Well, that's a bit harsh on my part, isn't it? The actual passage says, And the lesser light to rule the night, he made the stars also. Now, the Hebrew word that's used for stars there is is the word that perhaps is better uh, translated luminaries. Um, And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the uh, earth and so forth. So the focus is the sun and the moon, the two major objects that affect the earth. And then he made the stars also. 
the issue of the starlight and so forth is a topic for another day. But the wandering stars, the stars that were observed probably by uh, David out in the field when he was uh, taking care of the sheep, uh, that have been observed for thousands of years, these wandering stars were uh, observed but not uh, understood. If we go to the second passage where um, the uh, the second passage where stars, not stars, Mars is mentioned. Let's go over to Acts 17 and uh, notice what it says uh, there. Uh, now, this is Paul, and in Acts 17, 16, it says, And while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred within him, when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. One of the motivations that uh, Donnie has, that George has, and I have, is our spirits are troubled when we see the fruit of evolutionary humanism leading the world away from the truth of God's word. And so we can identify with Paul tonight. And the King James says he disputed in the synagogue. And the better translation of that word is he reasoned in the synagogue. And we want to reason with you guys. And he goes through the city and he sees all these things. And he ends up in verse 19 in the middle of Greek philosophy. And they took him and brought him into the Areopagus, saying, May we know what is this new doctrine whereof you speak? Now, in the Greek language, Areopagus means the hill of Ares or Mars Hill. Now, you need to understand uh, some of the balance between Roman mythology and Greek mythology, and I'll read uh, what uh, Dr. Henry Morris comments about these. Mars Hill is the same as the Areopagus. It's a hill near the Acropolis, probably used in Paul's day by a council that formally evaluated new religious or moral philosophies. George, in your worldwide travels, have you ever been to Athens and actually seen the Are the Are Areopagus three, three times, David. It must be quite a sight. Is it truly a hill or is it not a hill? Oh, it's a it's a hill. Yeah, it's a hill. Okay, and so uh, Ares was the Greek god of war, co corresponding to Mars in Rome, and so. This mention of Mars in uh, the Bible uh, brings me to the end of my five-minute introduction, which I'll summarize this way. Uh, as we look at a topic like the flood geology of Mars, and we look at the topic of whether Mars can fit into uh, an understanding of, first of all, how NASA argues with U.S. Conference, Congress for money and how they get money for the wonderful rovers that are on Mars. How do you balance that with the idea that the evolutionary community says, oh, you must give us money to go to Mars so that we can find life on Mars? Do you find that interesting also, George, as I turn it over to you? Uh, yes, um, I was uh, reading some of the chats, David, and I was surprised that uh, someone by the name of Den uh, questioned uh, you showing NASA and then uh, reading scripture. He took offense to that. Uh, but should I remind him that the person who actually made NASA what it is was a Christian, a German Christian? I think, it was, I think his name was von Braun. Well, if I'm not let mistaken, me, let me walk over 
and get a picture of me standing in line with Von Braun. I got to meet him in 1968. So let me walk over here and get my <laughs> photograph. I was going to save this for the second hour, but since you brought up Werner Von Braun, now when I showed the picture, you all picked me out. This is what I look like 50 years ago. Now, which one of these people, there's Werner Von Braun in the middle. Which one of these people are David McQueen? Can you make that full screen, Donnie? Whoever Donnie guesses correctly it. gets one of um, Professor McQueen's first edition Batman comics. Oh, Is that you? yes. Now, which uh, one the, me? The, the, Second the, from guy, the, the guy with the glasses. Oh, the guy with the glasses. Look at that. <laughs> and There's so them, I though, was George. given the privilege of shaking the old Nazi's hand there in uh, 1968. Now, when this photograph was taken, Von Braun was one of my uh, idols. Uh, in the 50 years since, I have read about uh, uh, him, and I realized that I had the opportunity to shake the hand of the man that shook Hitler's hand. But we'll turn to that the second hour. George, go on. Okay, uh, I'll start off with uh, something as well. Um, <clears throat> so, may the Spirit of God open your eyes to the light, your ears to the truth, and your heart to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, David, yes. uh, I was I was absolutely amazed when you mentioned you'd like to do something about Mars. It's actually an interesting subject to discuss because there's not a lot of information there. But yeah. what information is there is quite astounding when you compare the similarities between what we see in Mars and what's on Earth. So, so do you do you know did did you know that Mars is called the Red Planet? I'm 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 guessing that you do. Do you know why it's called the Red Planet? Oh, when I was in Canada, I collected a piece of Mars uh, in eastern Canada. I found this red rock. And since no rocks have been brought back yet from Mars, the red sandy uh, images that, George, you've helped me see and that we'll cover in the next two hours, this might as well be Mars, the red planet. Correct. Now, uh, tr true to my form, I'll begin with a little joke, okay? Please. Just just the other day, I got all sentimental when I saw my wife looking at our marriage certificate for yeah. half an hour, believe it or not, for half an hour. Amazing. It, tu it turns out she's been looking for an expiry date. Uh -huh, expiration <laughs> date. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, how sad. That is truly sad. It, uh, funny and sad at the same time, George. Okay. Right, Donnie, Donnie, I'm going to share the screen, so get ready, okay? I'm, I'm ready when you are. Uh, as, as, that, you're doing, you as you're doing that, George, I want to let everybody know in the chat, uh, tag me at Standing for Truth if you have any questions, challenges, arguments, so on and so forth. That's why we do these live. Uh, so, yeah, tag me with your questions. And so you see, you see that? Oh, it's laughing. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna take you on a road to nostalgia here. Ever since I can remember watching any science fiction movie, I recall the fascination of life from other planets. I mean, even Elon Musk was known to have said, and I'm paraphrasing here, by the way. Sorry, sorry about this. I don't, I don't have the exact quote, but he says he said, "If aliens exist, then what's taking them so long to get here?" Amen. That's, yeah, Amen. that's now. The, now, as I was talking about the nostalgia for for us older fossils, not for the young people in the audience, but uh, Donnie is a good sport, and uh, apparently he told me he will donate ten thousand dollars to my superannuation fund if anyone in the audience $10, can guess these movies. Oh no! <laughs> he yeah. may fall off his chair. <laughs> <laughs> I could, someone, someone call a doctor. I, th I, th I think he broke a rib. I think I, yeah, my back's a little sore now, George. I mean, I don't. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. You didn't even me before. I'm just now, kidding. what do they have to guess, George? That's what I want to know. 
Well, okay, I'll, I'll get to that. I, I was just kidding, Donnie. A th- $1,000 will do, okay? D- don't worry about the $10,000, okay? That's more reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. There's first clue. This was a classic. I, I used to love watching oh, this yeah. movie. I've seen the remake of this one. Yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah, I've seen the remake as well. But you know, you notice the robot in the background. Look, they've got they've got undies on the robot. <laughs> no. no, no. Most of my friends are this age. Those are the pins. Those are <laughs> adult underwear. That's not the guy's got a bowel problem from Mars. Yeah. Hey, George, and, that and, was high-end special effects CGI. Oh yeah, <laughs> and that's the movie, guys. If if you if you can get a hold of the original, the day the Earth stood still, I reckon you'll be surprised at how good it is. Oh, it is good. Yeah. Okay, that's Michael Rennie and Patricia Neal, Hugh Malone. That was Michael Rennie there. That's not Patricia Neal, by the way. That's the robot. That's good. <laughs> now, George, you prefer that movie over War of the Worlds? No, hold on. I've got a surprise for you, oh, Donnie. Oh. oh, no. Here we and go. Now, what's this one? What's this one? There, look at that. Look There's at that. I predicted the it. There you go. All about Mars, this one. And that's the remake. And that's too. the War of the Worlds. H.G. Mm, Wells. H.G. Wells. It, if, if anyone hasn't heard the actual recording with Orson Welles when he goes on radio yeah. and really fools the entire nation of America about yes. uh, Martians landing on Earth, this is unbelievable. You've got you to watch it. Okay, so, so what I'm going to do, this is, this is uh, some basic stuff I'm going to show you about, um, about Mars, but I'll also, I'll also get into the nitty-gritties of, uh, of some more detail. Professor McQueen showed earlier a, a um, sphere of uh, Earth and one of Mars. Well, that's the actual size differentiation between the two planets, right? So you'll not, you'd notice, uh, and um, in case you're not aware, so there, there's our moon that Dave was talking about, the lesser light of the, of, of the sky. Mars is that little white dot just there. That red, that red spot is just the cursor that uh, Matt Barm was using on the screen. And right to the left there is Jupiter, okay? So, so this is some basic stuff, okay? Uh, now, Mars is the fourth planet from the sun, as hopefully everybody knows, and it's the second most uh, s- uh, smallest planet in the solar system, being larger than, believe it or not, Mercury. In English, Mars carries the name of uh, the Roman god of war uh, and is often referred to as the red planet, as we mentioned earlier. Did you also know, though, granite is considered the signature rock of continents? More than that, granite is the signature rock of the planet Earth itself. Now, this is, this is great. Now, listen to this. The other rock planets like Mercury, Venus and Mars – are covered with basalt, as our oceans, ocean floors on Earth are, but only, only Earth has this interesting rock type in abundance. That is, the continents on Earth are unique, that consisting predominantly of granite, while the ocean floors are predominantly basalt. Now, the 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 the, the days and the seasons are comparable to those of Earth as well, because the rotational period, as well as the tilt of the rotational axis relative to the elliptic plane are also similar. <clears throat> now, just to show you some, uh, that the, my, most of the exploration that's occurred in Mars have been done by the European Space Agency and NASA. And these are some of the um, uh, bits and pieces of equipment they've gone there and actually given us uh, a lot of the information we have today. So, this is this is this is the big picture. Mars is this is the big picture. You'll notice it has a thin carbon dioxide atmosphere. It's 200 times thinner than Earth's. Its gravity is approximately one third of Earth, so I think it's around 38 percent actually. As I said, it's the fourth planet from the sun, and it's very very cold by the way, with annual uh, mean temperatures between 50 to 60 degrees uh, centigrade. <coughs> So there's lots of big geology, as we'll show you later on, 
It's incredibly dry, but it, ha it has solar po uh, polar ice caps, predominantly made up of um, frozen water and uh, dry ice. So it's also the best explored planet after Earth in, in our solar system. So this is the, I uh, was watching this video a couple of nights ago. Um, I think it's called Geology of Mars. As you can see there, Mars has an atmosphere, a very thin one. There are also clouds and winds are active uh, today. Uh, you'll see there's a lot of erosion caused by the uh, high-speed winds. And believe it or not, it has giant volcanoes and impact craters. Some of the volcanoes, one that I'll mention later on, is considered the tallest uh, and biggest uh, volcano in our solar system that we know of today. Uh, I, I mean, I can give you some basic, basic statistics, but this is really the, um, the composition of, of the atmosphere. For example, Mars, uh, as I said, has got a thin atmosphere, but it cons consists of 95.3% is carbon dioxide, whereas on Earth it's 0.038%, and nitrogen is 2.7% compared to Earth's 78%. And oxygen is 0.13% on Mars versus 21% on, on Earth. So I, I think I'll stop there as my introduction and then I'll get into um, uh, the nitty gritties. I'll, I'll talk about the magnetic field for a start because uh, I think you'll get the gist of what I'm saying because we covered the magnetic, the decaying magnetic field of Earth's a few weeks back and I just want to do an analogy between Mars, Mars's magnetic field and, and what we spoke about Earth a very, few weeks ago. Very good. That will be helpful. I'm going to go ahead and set my timer for 20 minutes and give a 20 minute introduction. And then I'll turn it over to my partner in crime or my research partner, better said, better said, um, for his 20 minute uh, uh, summary. Okay, so let's go ahead and begin with my 20 minutes. I've got my timer set, and let me have the screen, and we'll uh, go through things. If you want to pursue what George and I have found, uh, you need to go to a website that Ms. McQueen did research for me on, mars.nasa.gov. Now, one of the things I want to make clear from the very beginning, and I'll pursue this more afterwards is I want nothing that I say to be critical of NASA. Why? In my high school days, 55 years ago, I intended to be uh, an astrogeologist. I was so interested in the, in my, in my youth, the Mercury and then the Gemini and then the Apollo missions that I followed them very carefully. And I did, uh, science fair projects uh, on uh, the moon with the idea of uh, eventually uh, joining the United States Geological Survey, which I did uh, beginning in the late uh, 60s and going all the way through uh, the end of my employment with them in 1981. And I had hoped to end up in uh, the Astro geology group at uh, the United States Geological Survey, uh, cooperating uh, very closely with um, NASA. And I will show you the uh, diagrams and, and the work I did during the second uh, hour. The So even though I'm going to be critical of NASA in their funding of the wonderful missions to Mars that uh, George has outlined for us. The satellites they put in orbit over the years, the rovers that they have even now on the uh, Martian surface. As I have prepared for tonight's talk, as a geologist, I was very interested in the uh, whole issue of Okay, let me go to the uh, website of NASA and let me find what the chemistry is 
that the current rover is sending back day after day beautiful pictures of this Martian landscape. I have been able, I have been unable to find a very clear bit of data that was done in 2021. Now, in going back to my library, I have found my own copy of this 1993 book, uh, Moons and Planets, uh, by Hartman. And it's got a very good history of uh, the exploration of the, of the uh, Mars by telescope. But you need to understand how recent this is. My dad, this is Veterans Day week here in the U.S. My dad was in the U.S. Army in World War II, and I'll mention that to honor him. Uh, my dad fought in Europe at the same time that Werner von Braun was looking to launch his first rocket. Many of you may know that uh, von Braun's first rocket was never intended to go to the moon. Now, what is that European city that he intended to go to? Oh, he was hired by the Nazis to send that first rocket to London, which he successfully do, did. This is not a lecture about V1 and V2 rockets, but I must admit that my worship of von Braun 55 years ago has fallen to the side now. Uh, I, my intent is to honor my dad. My dad was born in 1914. My grandfather McQueen, my grandmother McQueen, were born uh, between 18, uh, early 1880s and all the way up to 1888. Now, why would I bring that up? A, an astronomer uh, whose name is difficult for me pr to pronounce, but I believe the pronunciation of his name is uh, Scarapelli in 1888. Uh, this Scarapelli uh, began to draw pictures you know, he would look in his telescope and he found uh, these lines that he could see in his telescope. And so he began to think, what could cause these lines? Well, in his day, there were many people that thought that there would be life on uh, other planets and certainly life on Mars. And there was a discussion that that went on for years by a variety of scientists um, about the lines on Mars being actual canals that were built. Let me read you a, an excerpt from this book that deals with uh, some work of a uh, French uh, observer and Tenali about 1930. Now, this is 1930 we're talking about here. Under mediocre observing conditions, some observers perceive canal-like streaks, as Lowell had described them. Under ideal observing conditions, observers with large telescopes that find that these streaks break apart into a complex pattern of modeling and dark patches. So keep in mind that up until the 1930s, this is, you know, when my dad uh, was a, a, a boy, uh, there was a viewpoint that um, this type of, uh, these, these types of lines that could be seen might be man-made. And this brings up the fascinating uh, side of what George talked about. Why do you think that when... Um, this radio broadcast that was so wonderfully done about the Martians coming to Earth, how come farmers in uh, Louisiana ran out of their homes? Farmers all over America thought that the Martians really had landed and that these enormous devices were coming to get them in Louisiana and Ohio and in California. The reason is that the scientific community falsely had assumed that evolution was true, 
and that we could see uh, things going on on the planet of Mars. Um, it was 1965 when I began high school that the first close-up spacecraft photograph of Mars were taken by what's called Mariner 4. And there were no signs of dying Martian cities or canals, only a moon-like uh, surface. In 1969, when my wife graduated high school, Mariner 6 and 7 flew by showing more craters and a hummocky formation that they called chaotic terrain. And so as the resolution of the spacecraft going to Mars has increased, so has increased our understanding of the red planet. Now, what is the data, the scientific data that we have so far? The scientific data on the planet Mars shows that we can see several things that are worthy of note. And let me make a list of them for us here. Um, so we see what we now come to know are polar ice caps. So there is water on Mars. The evolutionary community since World War II has been so excited by this. Why? Because water, H2O, is essential for life. But the story gets even more interesting as far as the evolutionary community is concerned. There is evidence of volcanic activity. So we've got water, we've got volcanic activity, and so we've got heat. And so going back to the long since disproven Miller-Urey experiment, where you are supposed to be able to make a primordial soup and put some lightning in it and heat this soup up so that we get uh, the beginnings of life, the evolutionary community went to the Congress in America in the 60s, 70s, and 80s and said, oh, we have a wonderful opportunity in our sister world of uh, Mars to find evidence of life. And so a lot of the equipment on the current rover is uh, supposed to be looking for evidence of microbial life. Well, what about the geology of Mars that we have discovered from the different spacecraft? Well, one of the very interesting spacecrafts that's uh, around, that's in orbit around Mars and has been for years, there's Mars there in the middle. And then in orbit around it is a spacecraft that has a spectrometer on it. Well, this spectrometer uh, excites me as a mineralogist because the spectrometer is able to look and see uh, what kind of minerals we're finding on Mars. Now, one thing that's very important to think about is we have to ask the question scientifically, why is Mars red? And as a geologist, the uh, answer would be, well, there must be iron oxides on Mars. Certain uh, ores of iron are black, but if you add iron and oxygen together, as it reacts, it can form a, a mineral that is red in color. And so this would explain the red appearance of Mars. And so you've got these oxides there. And once again, the evolutionary community gets, gets excited. Wait a minute. Is there oxygen there? Well, if there's free oxygen, maybe that's another characteristic of life we can find. Can you see from George's introduction that this is shot down by the fact that there's a tremendous amount of CO2 on, in the atmosphere of Mars, but not that much oxygen. And what do we know about the geology of the planet? Well, in the images that George is going to show us in the next hour and a half, you will see that 
in a section of Mars, which is shown on my chart here, is I got to move it where you can see it. Is what's called there we go, Vallis Marianas, a large system of canyons, two thousand four hundred miles long, and 125 miles wide and four miles deep. This uh, VM, as I, was as I am going to call it, because that's so difficult to pronounce in Latin there for me, uh, this valley on Mars that's down in the southern part has been observed by using this spectrometer in orbit. And what do they find there? Well, they find layered uh, rocks. So if you look at a cross-section of this enormous valley, now keep in mind that this valley would cover almost all of the entire uh, country of the United States. I mean, we're talking about something that's uh, 2,500 miles long. It's, a, it's an enormous uh, Grand Canyon of Mars. And so just like the Grand Canyon here on Earth is supposed to be where we can easily find evidence of evolution so that they look there for that. But what do they actually find? Well, they do, do find layered volcanic rock uh, in uh, this cross-section. In class, remember that whenever I draw a tree, this is an imaginary Martian tree, of course, uh, whenever I draw a tree, that means I'm talking about a cross-section. Let me go to another color to look at the mineralogy that has been figured out from this orbiter. And so in the different layers, uh, you do find minerals associated with igneous rocks, uh, minerals like pyroxene, olivine, have been... Uh, evaluated from this, and then I'll use circles here to, um, to illustrate what would be stratigraphically below it. And so here we have the evidence uh, of uh, the, the types of minerals that are found on Mars. Well, in other parts of Mars, you find an area where for many years, NASA has hired uh, some of the professors at the university that I not only got an education, I not only got a degree in science education from the University of Louisiana Monroe, one of their professors, Dr. Renee DeHaan, who's a personal friend of mine, supervised a even closer friend named Steve Archibald in studying the uh, geology of Mars, as could be seen by photographs. And so these two men, Rene DeHaan and Steve Archibald, discovered uh, that there are uh, river systems, uh, what look like river valleys, that have been cut when uh, water was active on Mars. I have a tremendous amount of respect for both these men, and uh, let me write down Rene DeHaan's, how do you spell his last name? You might want to go online and look at some of his papers. Now, he is no creationist. He doesn't agree with me. But he is a very careful um, photo interpreter. And this is the spelling of Dr. DeHaan's name. So you can look up uh, Dr. Rene DeHaan, and you'll find the evidence that he presented to NASA uh, that there has been the movement of water on Mars. Now, having said that, I acknowledge the expertise of my colleagues and friend like Steve Archibald, let me divert to a critique. If these men are so quick to identify in a planet all so far away where no human has ever gone down into this enormous VM Grand Canyon of Mars to actually collect the samples and to know exactly what is there. If they're so sure 
that we find evidence on Mars of the movement of water, why are they so reluctant to believe that there could have been a worldwide flood on Earth? The answer to this is philosophical. Because when you read the uh, uh, accounts that you get at the NASA website I gave, they're very quick to say, oh, this happened three billion years ago. And the activity of volcanoes on Mars was very great four billion years ago. And so you've got the deep time assumptions tied into the idea that we could only have local events on Mars, and we certainly can explain everything in the Grand Canyon and in um, the Eastern Mediterranean by looking at the concept of local floods. In previous feeds and in previous discussions, uh, George and I have uh, discussed the problems with this side of things. And so in the uh, minute that I've got left of my 20 minutes, how would I want to summarize uh, these issues? The data on Mars, the, the data about Mars, um, shows that there is a very clear evidence of ice caps. There's clear evidence of volcanic activity. But I would argue with my, with my big black Sharpie here that there is zero evidence from any of the uh, landers on, uh, on Mars uh, of, any, uh, of any evidence of life. Now, keep in mind, they're looking at microbial life. They're not expecting Martians to be walking uh, beside the uh, rovers on Mars. One of the comical things I've seen, George, you'll hear my timer go off here in a minute, I think. One of the comical things I've seen, uh, there we go, there's my, there's my 20 minutes up. Uh, one of the comical things I've seen before I turn it over to you, George, is a, it's a picture of a Martian carrying a poster in front of the, in other words, the Martian is behind the poster and he's walking in front of the, the rover, hiding the fact that he's there. And so <laughs> maybe the Martians are hiding from us, George. What do you think? I, I think you you haven't seen enough sci-fi sci movies, David, to know that the Martians left Mars ages ago. Oh, of course. There you I, go. That's that's why. It's, just, it's tragic when you don't watch enough science fiction to understand evolutionary thought. That's right. That's right. Too many people have watched Star Trek and Babylon 5 or whatever it was called. And they, and they uh, think that that's what uh, occurs in space all the time. So, yeah. Over to you, George. No worries, Donnie. I'm just going to share the screen. Uh, okay, so get ready. Uh, did you – hey, did, did you – I noticed you transferred $1,000 into my account. Oh, no. <laughs> that was 1,000 Chinese yen. Yes. That's not worth <laughs> oh, that, so that's that'd about right. a buck for you, George. <laughs> okay. C can you see the magnetic field there? Yes. Okay. A few weeks back, uh, Professor McQueen and I covered the decaying magnetic field on Earth. Uh, that's what a magnetic field looks like, by the way. That's, that's the Earth just there. And the cosmic rays from the sun actually distort the magnetic field there. And... Uh, it actually protects us from not only the radiation, but also it protects us from uh, our, atmosp our atmosphere is protected. It's not blown off off the planet planet like it has on Mars. So this is this is what this is what happens on Mars. Okay, That's, so you can see there's a le there's a lack of magnetic field, which meant most of the atmosphere was removed by the solar wind. It, it's also cold and lower surface temperature. The availability of, of liquid water is decreased, and water migrated underground as liquid as liquid and ice. Now, 
there's there there have been some photos that I've seen from um, the rovers and the other uh, equipment have actually excavated. the The ice is quite visible under under underneath the uh, the dirt. But one of the interesting things that I wanted to point out was uh, the secular explanation of ma the magnetic fields is what they call the dynamo model. They propose on Earth that the dynamo model as the reason why um, we haven't lost our um, our magnetic field. Uh, what they propose is the the magnetic field runs down to almost zero, then without loss of any efficiency, jumps back to 100%, and it just cycles every three to 700,000 years. I don't, I don't know how they can determine that, but that's what they say. So I'd like to, I'd like to ask, if Mars has got a liquid core or, or a core around about 2,000 degrees centigrade, what... What happens with with Mars? Does it, it have a dynamo as well to regenerate its magnetic field? Uh, I think that's it's good evidence to say that um, magnetic fields do decay. And in the case of Mars, you can see it's all gone. It's the reason why it's, uh, you know, the way it is, uh, pretty much desert and uh, strong winds. Uh, so that's all I had to say about the magnetic field. But now I'm going to go into water okay so professor mcqueen showed uh, a couple of examples of the um the canyons i'll talk about the specific one he mentioned later on so i'll just call it a canyon at this stage but you'll see that th those canyons can only be formed by water by running water liquid water and the size of some of these are just amazingly large I, th I think that's i think it's probably the largest canyon that's that we know of in our solar system yes okay so so i'd like to point out that many scientists agree that mars was once much wetter as as a matter of fact in 2001 nasa this is what nasa announced and, and i quote mars may once have been a very wet place a host of clues remain from an earlier era, and here's the assumption that Professor McQueen mentioned, billions of years ago, hinting that the red planet was host to great rivers, lakes, and perhaps even an ocean, end quote. More recently, geog uh, geographers have analysed an advanced map generated by a computer from satellite images. I've got an image that I'll show you later on which shows that. Now, they concluded that uh, there was a giant ocean in the northern hemisphere by, uh, fed by an extensive river network, in turn fed by rainfall. I don't know how they find that out, but uh, anyway, that's what they say. So many, many scientists, of course, reject the idea of a global flood on Earth, and we've heard that many times, yet they say... <coughs> and are certain that there was a watery cataclysm on Mars so enormous that it carved a three and a half, three and a half thousand kilometre long channel that is about 400 kilometres wide and up to two and a half kilometres deep. I think that might have been 40 kilometres uh, wide. And this on a planet only with about half the diameter of Earth and one-tenth the mass. But where did the water come from and where did it go? Uh, th this is one of the things uh, evolutionists keep telling us about, uh, you know, the earth. Where'd the water go? Meanwhile, here on earth, there is overwhelming evidence of all over the planet of a global flood. Despite this, most scientists insist a global flood did not happen. Hypocrisy or what? Double standards or what? Okay, so there's some more evidence of uh, water on Mars. You can see that that's a glacial, uh, glacial. Uh, what is it? Flow. You can see you can see it quite easily, and you can equate it to images that we have here on Earth. Also, um, I, I'm assuming that's that's a lake, a former lake. Now, as I said, note the similarity to Earth's glacial flows. This is the um, 
the canyon that uh, Professor McQueen was talking about. It's called the Vallis Marineris. It's a system of canyons that runs uh, along the Martian surface, as it's on the east of the Tharsis region. And if you were to superimpose that, as Professor McQueen uh, rightly pointed out, it would extend from the east coast of the US right across to the west coast. Amazing. But I'd like, yeah, I'd like you to see though. You notice the deltas, the delta that occurs there. That's evidence of of a uh, flowing water. So, as I said, if if the Vallis Marineris was superimposed, and I've said that, and, and you'll notice here. Right next to the Vallis Marinaris are these three volcanoes. So um, there, there's heaps of evidence, by the way, of uh, of these um, uh, similarities to Earth. So, so, so as, as I said, in the in the um, instance of the volcanoes, um, it has one of the largest volcanoes that we know of. It, it's called the Olympus Mons. It's the highest known mountain on any planet in our solar system. And the Vallis Marineris is one of the largest canyons in our solar system. Now, now just some other bits of information you should know about. Uh, Mars has two moons uh, named Phobos and Deimos, which are small and irregular shaped. They're not spherical like our moon or some of the other moons, larger moons, uh, of some of the other planets. Um, uh, the, the, for example, the shield volcano uh, that is the Olympus uh, Mons uh, is, is an extinct volcano in the vast upland region of Tharsis, as we mentioned. This contains several other large volcanoes, as you can see. Um, Olympus Mons is roughly three times the height of Mount Everest, which in comparison stands at just over... Pff, what is it, eight, eight point something kilometres? Uh, I think it's 8.8. .8. It, it is either the tallest or the second tallest mountain in the, in the solar system, uh, depending on how it is measured, of course, uh, with various sources giving figures ranging from uh, about 21 to 27 kilometres. That's, that's a big volcano, guys. When you compare that to Mount Everest at eight um, kilometres or so, that's a, that's a big, big volcano. And, and the other thing you should also look at is the Mars is, is scarred by a number of impact craters. They estimate a total of 43,000 craters with diameters of um, five kilometres or greater have been have been found. Now, Professor McQueen spoke about mineralogy. The What, what they do is they identify various minerals by what they call um, – an infrared uh, crystallography, I think, or crystallograph, uh, some kind of machine that does that. Yes. And and this is one of one of the other things that they that they actually have done is they've looked at what they call primary minerals and secondary minerals, and based on on those uh, analyses, uh, some some geologists say uh, because of the temperature they're formed. It may not have been water, but others say because of one side of the it has got a higher temperature, it's it's due to um, what is it? Uh, yeah, la lateral lateral uh, expansion of the of the crust. So I don't know who's right or who's wrong. Maybe uh, Professor McQueen can talk about that uh, in in more detail later on. Interesting theory uh, that this uh, NASA scientist has come up with that there's tectonic movement yeah. uh, along that huge uh, Vallis Marianus, however you pronounce it. Um, good point, George. Yeah. Uh, if, if you want to read a, a short but quick um, sort of article by our own Michael Michael Ward, that, that's the – what is the origin of the Martian floods? It's uh, You can search for it. You can download as a PDF. And uh, like I said, it's probably going to take you maybe three to five minutes to read, so it's short and uh, quite succinct. Actually, it, it goes into um, that um, that topic of um, where the origin of the Martian floods came from. George, uh, excuse me, we're yep. at the one hour mark, so why don't we take uh, fifteen minutes worth of uh, questions? And I, then... Actually, can I? 
can I just finish this off? It's oh, just okay. the, li li the life sure. on Mars. Sure. What 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 they what they propose that um, if in if in the case of an asteroid crashes onto Mars, there'd be rock debris that that will fly off into space, and due to the um, movement through the solar system, in, in some in some way, it can actually fall onto Earth, and that will prove that there's life on Mars. Now, keep keep in mind. Um, the cre uh, creationists also propose that the same thing could have happened where maybe um, something had hit, hit, hit Earth or maybe, as in the hydroplate theory, uh, ejected material was flung into space and it's just coming back to rest, rest on Earth where it came from. So th if they do find life on Mars... It doesn't prove anything. It may very well prove that uh, Noah's flood actually did did happen, and and some of those rocks were flung out into space um, at at escape velocity and are just returning back to the planet. Okay, well I'll finish. I'll finish there, and um, I'll talk about the geology on Mars in a bit more detail in the second. Um, okay. Twenty minutes. Good. I've noticed some questions that have come up. Um, uh, one comment of my future uh, opponent in my debate coming up is he asked about uh, there is detectable amounts of methane on Mars and I'll ask George to see if in his research I did not write down the actual percent of methane in the Martian atmosphere but let's assume that there's quite a bit and uh, the reason that the evolutionary community finds this so interesting is, of course, methane is part of what is considered to be part of the atmosphere conducive to life in the old Miller-Urey experiment uh, of the idea of chemical evolution. Uh, we have discussed this in the past, and there are other sessions that uh, Donnie can highlight that shows the critique of this, uh, even if you have abundant um, energy, abundant carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, abundant methane, there's still no way that you can get a whole test tube full of left-handed amino acids to be able to go on to build something that's um, uh, dealing with life. I went back to some of John Mackay's old videos from the mid-1990s, and he very clearly pointed out, and has pointed out for the last 30 years, that a, a can of sardines does have evidence of life once was in it, but the older the can of sardines is, the more the left-handed amino acids uh, convert to right-handed. And so when evolutionists have been asked why everything in our body is a left-handed amino acid, uh, their flippant answer is, "Well, maybe God's left-handed." Uh, not a very good. Uh, not a very good. <laughs> no. Another question in the uh, feed is uh, from uh, uh, Jason Torn. I think is his name. What's the overall hypothesis or objective of our discussion tonight? And that's a legitimate uh, question. Let me give my summary. And then when I take a break here in a few minutes, I'll let George give his summary. Why are we doing this? Uh, my motivation is this. As someone that has loved NASA for almost 60 years now, I am anxious for NASA to explore not only uh, Mars, but Jupiter and Uranus and the others, Saturn, their moons and all the rest. So I'm a lover of NASA on the right side of my brain. On the left side of my brain, as a taxpaying American citizen, for all of my adult life, I hate to see NASA going to Congress and saying, please give us 
a billion dollars so we can plan to go to Mars to find life. I think we should go to Mars. I think we should plan a human mission there because these robots and all the rest, they can only tell us so much. You need a human being there to actually pick up the rock and to do this and to do that, to be able to do legitimate research. And of course, we need to bring these rock samples back to Earth. And so I'm a huge fan of NASA on the right side of my brain. On the left side of my brain, I hope you can understand my criticism. Donnie, what would be another question that you have on your feed, please? Great question. So the next question we have comes in from Sean Mock. Thank you for your question, Sean. He asks, uh, for your guests, did Mars flood, did the flood on Mars create mountains and plate tectonics? Well, I'll certainly give my uh, view on that and then George can follow up. Um, the flooding on Mars is evidently not global as it is as the Bible reveals here on Earth. And so the huge Olympus Mons uh, volcano, which is on, uh, on Mars, um, was created by volcanic activities. There, is, there are craters. There are evidences of meteorite impacts on Mars. Um, some of my colleagues believe that uh, some of the uh, meteorites that have been found, uh, even in my home state here of Louisiana, may actually be Martian meteorites. And this is uh, concluded by looking at the trace element and percent oxygen and so forth, oxygen isotopes and so forth. Um, so that's the, the idea of uh, the mountains being primarily volcanic. You'll notice that in one of the slides George showed, uh, the NASA scientist thought that, uh, or observed, that in this huge Grand Canyon of Mars, the two sides of the uh, canyon don't match. And so there might have been some plate tectonic movement there, which is of tremendous interest to someone like me that is uh, has a long-time interest in mountain building and, and uh, plate tectonics. And so uh, the movement of these very active parts of Mars shows to me that we've got a young universe. We've got a universe that is less than 10,000 years old. As George has correctly pointed out, the magnetic field on Mars is gone now. And the reason it's gone is that there is no regeneration. I'm sorry, not regeneration. There's no maintenance mechanism, as he and I have talked about in the flow of uh, electrons equatorially on Earth and the fact that there is a, uh, when you have electrons flowing uh, this way, you have a magnetic field by the right-hand rule. There's none of that on Mars. So Mars is a uh, planet that had its purpose, that has its purpose in God's plan. But as my former boss, Bob Gentry, pointed out, and I think it's worth thinking about, we could perhaps return to this later on, that uh, the, the flood of Noah's day and the events that happened on Earth might have been solar system wide. And so it may be that the far side of the moon is so heavily cratered because during the time of the catastrophe uh, on Earth, there were a tremendous number of uh, meteorites coming toward Earth and God has protected us over the last 6,000 years by the moon, our moon, absorbing these. Does that make sense to you, George? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll present some more information on the geology of, of Mars with some images that I um, attained from uh, some videos that I watched um, from some geologists and professors, etc. And uh, 
what I will do is, uh, uh, Donnie, I'll take one more question, and then I'll take my one-hour break and leave it for you and George to elaborate, okay? Okay, perfect. Let me um, put this question up on screen. Jackson Rowe, again, I appreciate the question. He says, uh, for David, what are your thoughts on Europa and 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 Saladus? And Claudius. And okay. Claudius. Okay. Now, <laughs> uh, I have to pause here. I want to make sure that uh, – let me pull my own chart around. Mm. Uh one of the moons on uh, cir circling uh, Mars is called Phobos. The Europa, that's a moon of what? That's a moon of Saturn, is it? Or oh, Jupiter, I'm not sure. Jupiter, I can't find it uh, on my chart here. Um, let me write these two down. And I'll look at them during the break. Yeah, it's Go ahead and put it that like. graphic back up there for me so I can get the correct uh, spelling of these two. I assume these are not volcanics. I assume these are not volcanoes on Mars. Looks like it's it's Jupiter, Jupiter and for Saturn. Europa and Saturn okay. for Enceladus. Okay. Enceladus. Yeah. Okay. So it's E N. How do you spell it? C E. Uh, Okay. L A, I think it was. D U S. I can find it on Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, Jackson, I'll return to that in our Q and A the second hour. Uh, give me something to do during my break. Go ahead and drop my video, and you pick it up, my friends. Okay. Thank you, Professor McQueen. Well deserved break. This has been a fantastic presentation so far. So we'll see you in a couple minutes. George, I'm going to hand it to you, George, real quick to like add whatever you want to. Um, I know you've got a lot of notes and things that you've prepared for this. So in the meantime, let me just quickly go over a couple reminders and then I'm going to hand it back to you. Um, so that being said, reminders for everybody. The 17th, we're going to have Professor David McQueen and Jackson Rowe. Uh, they are going to be debating Noah's Ark and Noah's Flood fact or fiction. Uh, that's going to be a ton of fun. Definitely going to be a debate to remember. Uh, Jackson Rowe was here last week. He debated uh, Kent Hovind on is there evidence for human evolution. So he's definitely no stranger to this channel. Also on Thursday from the creation research team, we're going to have Sam Jenkins and Joseph Hubbard who will be here. Sam Jenkins will be giving the presentation uh, titled an analysis of the flood account in Genesis. So bring your questions uh, bring your challenges, objections, whatever you got to the flood account in Genesis, because we're also going to have Joseph Hubbard here who's going to be helping with questions. So that's definitely going to be a ton of fun. At the end of the month, Joe uh, Hubbard's going to be back here as well for another presentation titled uh, the, the post-flood boundary or the flood boundary. So that's going to be awesome. That's definitely a hot topic, hotly debated topic in Young Earth creationist circles. We've also got a an epic Trinity debate in a couple weeks. Is God one or three divine persons? Kelly Powers and Stacy Turbeville. And last reminder, uh, at the end of the month, actually, no, my mistake, first week of December, uh, soteriology, once saved, always saved, question mark with Dr. Layton Flowers from Soteriology 101. So I'm looking forward to that discussion. That's going to be awesome. So that being said, uh, George, over to you, brother. Okay. Uh, I need to share the screen. Uh, I was hoping uh, Professor McQueen would be here to um, actually uh, see, see this because it's more uh, in his area, but uh, I'll continue on anyway. I'm sure he's listening. So I'll just share the screen. If you, and, want, uh, if you yeah. want, you can answer a couple questions while he's away, if you want to wait for him for this, or it's totally up to you, brother, what works Well, best. if I can, I'm not sure whether my expertise is in that area, but um, what's one of the questions? Let's have a look. Actually, it does look like he's back. Um, let me see if he's ready to come back in, though. Um, okay, he says he's listening. He's listening, so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, go ahead, George. Yeah, let's share your screen. Okay, let's uh, share the screen. 
As I said, they, they, these are these are actual images uh, from Mars. Sorry to the flat earthers, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, you can you can see you can see with that uh, coloured um, rectangles, squares, and circles what uh, they represent. Is the blue is the polar caps? As we said, most of it is um, uh, uh, ice and um, dry. Uh, uh, sorry, liquid ice. Sorry, no uh, water as ice or or dry ice and you'll notice the the volcanoes in red okay the impact craters in purple the green canyons the ones that we spoke about the Valles Marineris and the um yellow i think it's yellow are the outflow channels they're the ends of the um of the actual um canyons so, so, be, be so now I'll just I'll just sort of explain. There's some more evidence of um, of river flow. You've got your deltas, very similar to what we've got on Earth. There are the streams and the rivers. But uh, besides uh, silicon oxygen, the most abundant elements in the Martian crust are apparently iron, as we said with the redness color of the of the soils. Magnesium, aluminium, calcium, and potassium. Now, keep in mind, that's the most abundant elements. We're not saying they're the only elements. So the other, the other important thing is the average thickness of the planet's crust is about 50 kilometres with uh, a maximum thickness of 125 kilometres. Now, by comparison, Earth's crust it averages around 40 kilometres. Uh, I think if you've watched some of our previous streams, We've mentioned that numerous times. Now, believe it or not, Mars is seismically active. Of course, we don't call them earthquakes. We call them Mars quakes. Now, with uh, the InSight recording over the 450 Mars quakes and, the, and their related events in 2019, in, t in, um, in 2021, it was reported that based on 11 low-frequency Mars quakes, detected by the inside lander, the core of Mars is indeed liquid and has a radius of about 1,830 kilometres and a temperature of around 2,000 Kelvin. That's roughly around 17, 1,800 degrees centigrade. Oh, so I was right, actually, uh, when I said earlier that um, it's a liquid core and it's around 2,000 degrees centigrade. So that, that's good. My memory's not failing me. Okay, the um, the Phoenix lander. This is another another exploration. Returned data showing the Martian soil to be slightly alkaline and containing elements such as magnesium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, and chlorine. Now, these nutrients are also found in soils on Earth, and they are necessary for the growth of plants. Experiments uh, apparently performed by the lander showed that the Martian soil has a basic pH of 7.7, uh, .7, which is roughly the alkaline alkalinity, uh, and contains 0.6% of um, uh, a thing called salt perchlorite. Now, concentrations, these are the concentrations that they find them are actually toxic to humans. So the images that, that I'm going to show you a little bit later now uh, show, show tilted layers of sediment that were likely created by flowing water. These are not my words. They're, these are words of scientists and geologists that uh, have looked at these images. And also note, please, that they're rather flat, even uh, layers that would have been due to wind or other processes, right? If you look at these images, you're basically staring at this epic desert landscape you could go to Australia or anywhere there's a desert and you'd probably think um, when, when you see these photos of Mars, you probably think that you're on, you're on Earth. There, there's, there's not a drop of water anywhere, by the way, and yet here we have evidence of a very different past, something very profound happened in the planet's history, as you can see with that. So this is... This is um, how, how they identify uh, the minerals on Mars, as I said, I think they do it via uh, infrared spectrometry. Um, 
and they've actually looked they're, they're the various uh, landers uh the phoenix viking one pathfinder opportunity uh, Perseverance, Viking 2, Insight, Curiosity, Spirit. I think they're, they're the, just the NASA ones. There's a, a couple other ones that um, are from the European Space Agency. But uh, so this is uh, how they identify the minerals uh, on, on Mars, the, <coughs> the orbital measurements, remote sensing, the mineral bonds vibrate in infrared. So if you, if you watch this video, they actually show an animation of how they actually um, assess assess the soils and the rocks that they're looking at. Uh, also, with the igneous, there's different types of uh, minerals, by the way. There's the igneous mineral rocks on Mars. Uh, very little quartz, by the way. As I said um, earlier, there's no granite on Mars. Uh, the only planet that we know of that has granite is, is Earth. There's very little evidence of, extent, of extensive magmatic evolution. <clears throat> and there's also the metamorphic minerals also. And I'm assuming that's one area they actually explored. <clears throat> they, they, they noticed that they've got low-grade metamorphism occurring, uh, which is consistent with the lack of uh, plate tectonics. Uh, keep in mind what we said earlier about... Um, one of the explanations for the Valus Marianaris was that um, there was horizontal as well as lateral uh, uh, expansion of the crust that may have formed that that canyon. And um, as as that says, there's uh, the the fact that there's low grade metamorphism is consistent with the lack of uh, plate tectonics. There's also sedimentary deposits, and you'll find I, I don't know how they can actually. <laughs> Put those dates to them you know 3.5 to 4 billion years uh, 3.5 to 3.7 billion years i think that they're just assumptions secular assumptions that um i think you're right they, on that point yeah yeah right. make it they tr they're trying to get a consistency between what they what they say about the earth and and mars but uh here's some images uh you'll find of uh sedimentary rocks that uh were identified and pictured by the various um uh, uh, land landing craft that went there, and they've also named them um, names as well. They've given them names. You can see that's the Kimberley uh, sandstone. Uh, look at those rocks. You, you'd think you were on a desert in Australia or uh, America or the Sahara. That's, that's a very astute observation. Uh, yeah. Very good point. Yeah, and there's 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 more. And notice notice this top image here. Look at the lamina lamina deposits there. Uh, I find that hard to believe that uh, wind can do that. Uh, may, maybe volcanic uh, eruptions and um, gravity settling down may may have formed them, but I, I find it hard to believe. When I see something like that as an engineer, I, I think of uh, water flow depositing those layers in um, in those particular layers, and uh, you, you'll also note that you know on Earth, if we saw something like that, they'll they might put millions of years to each one of those, or even thousands of years to those layers. But notice, there's very little um, uh, evidence of erosion for for a planet that has high winds. You know why why aren't they eroded? They they, they shouldn't be as horizontal like that. And see, George, you're bringing yeah. up some issues that can form a research project next year because if we're arguing that Mars was created around 6,000 years ago and the winds have blown as evidence that they that you've shown already uh, of the winds blowing, how come they're not even more erosion. Um, as we uh, come now to the hour and a half mark, uh, I wanted to do one lighthearted thing and then return to some of the serious questions, if that's okay, Donnie. Yeah, I'll just I'll just finish this off. Uh, probably another couple of minutes, David. You, you'll okay. notice you notice that image is showing old soaker desiccation cracks. You could probably talk more about uh, that because I don't know much of, uh, much about them. But uh, again, I'll, I'll just say you know on a on a planet that um, is subjected to strong uh, winds, whether it be at 
by cosmic uh, cosmic rays, etc. Uh, why are they so well preserved? Uh, and this this is interesting. One one of the um, uh, I think the landers that went it followed, it followed this path and it did some analyses of various um, samples that it took. And it, and this this shows you the actual components, uh, the mineral components of those samples as it actually went further and further out into its path. You'll notice at, at, look, at measured felspar, uh, mafic, igneous, magnetite, hermatite. Hermatite is just another fancy word for iron oxide ru or rust. Uh, uh, right. Arcarganelles. Uh, is that, did I pronounce that correctly, David? Arcarganelles. I, I, I can't see the graphic real clearly. Uh, what's oh. the spelling of that mineral? As that, uh, let me just blow that up to 200%. It says uh, A K A G A N E I T E. Sorry, Arcarganite. I, I was right the first time. Okay. Yeah, so that's, I, a mineral I, I'm, that's a mineral I'm not familiar with, but yeah. the other minerals are uh, uh, standard uh, minerals. And this is a fascinating. Uh, now, is this the rover that's on there right now, the Perseverance rover? I, or is I this think, one of the older ones? No, I think it is. I think this is the latest information, and that that comes from the Mineralogical Society of America. There's there's a yeah. video you can you can watch. It's called yeah, Advances. Advances uh, in the Mineralogy of Mars. So if, okay. if you're interested, you can you can get more information yeah, there. And I, I do want to pursue that because that's valuable information. Um, and, and they've, well, they've, they've they've also they've also actually produced. Um, you probably know what these are. This is a geological map of Mars. Yeah, yeah. I've uh, the two scientists I spoke of earlier, the professor Rene Dehan and his student, my friend Steve Archibald, worked on that uh, geologic map. I wanted I, to I, have a thirty seconds worth of fun here before we get into the next well, serious part. Here, here's some more images, David, of laminar, laminar deposits, conglomerates. Good. You know what yeah. they are. But also also notice these rocks here are quite smooth and polished, which means that, that there was some water uh, movement yeah. that, that would have caused them to be smooth and rounded. Yeah. Now, they could be rounded by the action of wind, Wind, but yeah. uh, uh, the uh, the the fact that water flowed in the past uh, over these rocks um, is an interesting point and a good point of scientific data. Yeah, um, uh, I think we've seen that image before. Yeah, right. And yes, it was the Perseverance rover images revealed flash flooding before ancient Martian lake disappeared there's there's yeah. the uh link to that so yeah i'll stop sharing and um we'll get into some of the the other bits and pieces yeah. one one bit of humor before we go to more serious things in my youth there was a tv show called my favorite martian and when he would communicate with mars an antenna would come up out of his head and you see how i have become a martian <laughs> yeah, yeah. Antenna coming up out of my head um, I have looked up the question uh, from the uh, previous discussion and the challenge about Europa, which is the smallest of the Galilean moons, is that uh, it turns out it's the sixth largest moon in the solar system. It was discovered in 1610, so it's been known about for a long time, uh, 390 million miles away, but why was it even brought up by my future opponent there? Um, NASA says that the images they have and the data they have is there's persistent water vapor over the atmosphere of Europa. Now, keep a lot, keep in mind, this is uh, uh, orbiting around um, the uh, planet uh, Jupiter. Now, why would this be of interest to the evolutionary community? Once again, the idea that they're trying to use to trick Congress, who've been 
a lot of the congressmen have not been trained in science and don't understand the analytical viewpoint. They come into these meetings or given an hour and they say, listen, guys, the reason we need a billion more of David McQueen's tax money is that there's water vapor on Europa. There's evidence of past water on uh, Venus. I'm sorry. There's evidence of past water on Mars. And so we need this money so that we can prove to the American public, especially these creationists and other conservatives that seem to have this idea that the Bible can be trusted. The Bible can't be trusted because if you would just give us a hundred million dollars more, we could find evidence of microbial life, maybe on the Galilean moon of Europa and certainly on Mars. Now, because I am a critic of that side of NASA, I want to spend a moment showing you how I have not always been this way. Uh, in my high school days, I studied the geography of, of the moon. And from 55 years ago, here's a plaster of Paris model that I made uh, of an area of the moon, the Caucasus Mountains. Uh, this is uh, near the... Uh, what we would call the prime meridian of the moon. Let me make sure I don't drop this thing. It's so old it would fracture. But here's the map that I made. And uh, these this mountain range is at zero degrees longitude on the moon. And so my science fair project was to go through these mountains that you see with the dark lines there. Uh, and to look at the length of their shadow, and I was able to determine the relative uh, uh, height of the mountains uh, using high school trigonometry. Now, if some of you, and you'll notice that this is an inverted image here. Notice my compass rose south is to the north here. Uh, south is near the top of the map. But if, if you're an astronomy hobbyist, You'll notice the uh, crater Cassini here. Uh, and one of the uh, evidences of having a good telescope is if you can resolve the craters inside Cassini. So some of you may know that. Some of you may know the, uh, the crater Aristoteles uh, down at the bottom here. Uh, so I was able to be acknowledged in my science fair work for doing this uh, uh, study of the moon and lunar geology and lunar uh, geography will be a future topic for us. And so in my comments, don't misunderstand uh, my love of NASA, but you also need to understand that uh NASA is uh, the leadership of NASA. And this is going back to Von Braun's day uh, in the 60s and all the way uh, back to the Mercury program in the 50s. NASA's senior leadership have been trained in evolutionary universities. They believe that it's a legitimate request to Congress to have the money to um, to have the money to go to Mars and to go to the Moon to look for evidence of life. Now, let's not miss the point of the historical side of what George and I have talked about. If you go back to the observations made in my grandfather's day, very crude maps that were drawn from telescopes available at that time of the what they thought were uh, actual canals that had been built by Martians on Mars. You go all the way up until the 1930s, the assumption that there's life outside of 
our world dominated the thinking. Now, this is not just science fiction. It's not just War of the Worlds kind of stuff. This is uh, an assumption made by some of the senior scientists in the 1930s and 1920s. And so when the radio broadcast was made, uh, people that were modest, of modest educational backgrounds, that didn't understand that it was a fictional thing that was being read on the radio, people of modest means, people that were some of my uh, highly intelligent but poorly educated uh, relatives in East Tennessee and Western North Carolina, they really thought that the Martians were coming, that they had already landed and were coming to eat their cows or whatever they intended to eat as they went from uh, the northern part of America down into uh, Tennessee and and, uh, and North Carolina. So one of the things I've thought about is an earlier question, why spend this time on Mars? Why talk about the mineralogy and so forth? Well, the issues that, um, that George presented, the data that has been gathered about the chemistry of pyroxenes and feldspars and so forth, that is legitimate scientific information of tremendous interest to uh, uh, a, a geologist like me. But how does this tie back uh, to what the Bible says? Well, as a Christian, I look forward to heaven. And what does the Bible say? in the book of Revelation about what heaven will be involved with. Well, if you go to the final chapter of, uh, uh, of Revelation, that's Revelation 22, it talks about uh, not the water on Mars, but the water that will be in the New Jerusalem. And he says, 22.1, and he showed me a pure water, a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And then it goes on to describe how there are trees growing on either side of this river, and the leaves are for the healing of the uh, uh, of the of the nations. Um, and as you uh, read in the previous uh, chapter, when it talks about uh, the, the details of uh, this New Jerusalem. Um, it says this in Revelation 21, 21. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every gate was one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. As a scientist, I know that gold is malleable. No matter how flat you beat it, uh, it's never going to become transparent. So there are going to be new things to see. But in the same book of Revelation, it says that those that put their trust in Christ will serve God. And I wonder what God's purpose is uh, for Mars in the future. I actually think that in uh, the kingdom of Christ, the thousand-year reign of Christ, that George and me and Donnie might have the opportunity to go to Mars, to actually walk ourselves uh, on the planet Mars. Now, because we will have new bodies, it might be fun to dress up in a spaceship, a space suit, but we won't need it. And we can actually pick up rocks like this uh, from Mars. And we can note that there are layers like we have talked about. Now, some of you that are critics of the Bible will be thinking right now, probably, well, McQueen has lost his mind. The very idea that we might be able to explore the moons of the solar system that I have illustrated behind me, uh, what a foolish idea. Well, is it foolish 
or is it a consequence of the allowing the parts of the Bible that we do understand, for example, of the worldwide flood, the details that are given there that we've talked about, to help us explain the parts of the Bible that we don't understand. A philosopher, kind of, he was also a comedian, was once asked in the United States, um, do you understand all that the Bible says? And he said, well, uh, actually, it's the, the part of the Bible I do understand that worries me more. There's obviously parts I don't understand, but I worry more about the parts I do understand. Does this make sense to you, George and Donnie, as I have summarized? Gentlemen, are you there? I've got a further proposal to make, David. Yes. Why don't, why don't you and I uh, go to Congress and present an argument to them? You can make one of those pl uh, those plaster casts, put an, put an X on it and say you believe or we believe that before the Martians fled, they hid all their gold and diamonds and we should go there and retrieve it before they get back. And get them before they come back. Well, in a couple of years when I visit you in Australia, I'm sure <laughs> we'll feel free to go to the very conservative Australian um, uh, Congress. Well, there's Ms. McQueen in the background working in her nook. Wave to everybody, Ms. McQueen. Good day, Shirley. Uh, uh, I'm sure you and I will be given the freedom to go to the Australian government and ask them to cooperate with the U.S. government and have the U.N. send a group to Mars. But again, Donnie, I don't want to go off on a bunch of this kind of stuff. What's an additional um, question that we could take up seriously? So here's a good question that um, came in. Forgive me if, if you um, answered this already. I've been watching and monitoring the chat. From Sean Mock again, he says, question for both. He says, if you allow me, how do you interpret the radiometric dating of Mars rocks or any planetary rock? Well, I'll give the first comment and I'll limit myself to 60 seconds. Then I'll turn it over to George. Um, we have no rocks from Mars like we have rocks from the moon. And so... As a professional geologist, as someone that's been interested in this for 50 years, it's as George pointed out in the previous hour, they are making assumptions that the lowermost layers, and where's my rock here? They're making assumptions that that uppermost white band is younger than the lowermost thinner white band. And that is called the law of relative bedding. No question that the bed on top was laid down after the bed on the bottom. And so they take the age of the, of the solar system of 4.5 billion years, and they look at this enormous Grand Canyon of Mars, and they said, well, the basement rocks on Earth are in the Grand Canyon, near the base of the Grand Canyon. They're uh, 4 billion years old. Why not on Mars? And then they build their argument based on that. And it's an argument with no rocks in hand. What do you think, George? <clears throat> well, we, we recently uh, produced a short uh, video on radiometric dating, which sort of dispels uh, any confidence someone can have in, in that dating system, a actually any of the dating systems, because... We showed them there where, where they actually did uh, dating of the rocks on the Grand Canyon and what they found with, with various uh, isochrons and, and potassium argon uh, uh, systems. And what they found, David, the difference between the youngest rock, uh, or the, the difference between the youngest dated rock and the oldest dated rock, there was a factor of 260,000. And what, what they found was in the case of the you 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 can you ret, uh, lava flow and the um, 
the basement rocks, it yeah. it contradict it contradicted itself. The the actual um, the lava flow is actually dated yeah. older than the base rocks, which made it ridiculous. No. And, and not only that, they also found Indian artifacts in the lava flow, which they estimated are between eight hundred to a thousand years old. So it's a complete a fallacy when they when they say yeah. you know radiometric dating works yeah. i mean For the I'll, give you, I'll get, just give you another another example in the kbs tough they were trying they were trying to date a skull that they thought was a certain age they kept dating yeah. it with every possible um, process and they couldn't get the date they wanted so what they did was they went to the decay constants and they used a decay constant that gave them a, the date that they wanted. I mean, yeah. these are constants. How right. can you vary a constant? And for those of you that are new, you know, George and I think of this as a worldwide classroom. And so for those of you that are new, you deserve a quick answer. So what is the quickest critique I can give of radiometric dating? The quickest critique comes from, the man I used to work for, Bob Gentry, at Oak Ridge National Labs. I worked for him in the early 70s. He looked at what the evolutionary community considers to be evidence of the constancy of radioactive decay through time. And what he found is that these pleochroic halos that he studied in some detail, if the decay rate had been constant, the diameter of a given uranium or polonium, I'm pronouncing P-O, polonium halo, should be the same through time. And so he looked at it stratigraphically, and it turns out they're not the same through time. So this is objective scientific evidence that the radioactive decay rate has varied with time. And now let's go back to this whole concept of how do they even begin to suggest what the dates are. Well, if you look at my 55-year-old map here of uh, this part of the moon, if you look at it in some detail, you can see that there are impact craters in the uh, uh, crater Cassini that obviously happened after Cassini was formed. And so you can get relative times by looking uh, across the entire moon and you can say, oh, the craters inside Cassini obviously occurred after this uh, crater. Now, keep in mind that in the geology of the moon, if you go back to my high school days and before the, well, let's go back to my elementary school days, before the Apollo missions, there was a huge debate as to whether the craters were volcanic or impact. Well, now we know that they were, most of them are impact craters. They may have precipitated volcanic events, but they're predominantly uh, impact craters. And so the way that the geology of Mars was put together is that they look at the overall uh, uh, surface, and you can see where certain things have been impacted on top of others, and water has carried things on top of others. And so uh, you can uh, look at it that way. One comment that I want to make that might clarify my discussion about the book of Revelation is there are certain things that have been revealed to mankind and other things that are unrevealed. What's the clearest way I know to say this? It's a definition of revelation that I learned uh, years ago from Dr. Ken Boa, and it goes this way. God has revealed himself to man in the Bible things that he otherwise could never know. So no person was alive uh, watching the formation or the erosion of the Grand Canyon. There were no windows, so to speak, on, the, on Noah's Ark uh, in the sense of something he could watch what was going on, especially what was happening underneath the water. And so there was no human there in the first few days of creation. So we need God's word as a revelation of what we otherwise could not know. George, what do you think? Yeah, I was going to add uh, something. Um, 
we we often we we often hear from um, evolutionists, uh, anti-creationists who believe in uh, on old Earth. When when we do find uh, items with uh, significant amounts of uh, intrinsic carbon fourteen, they always uh, claim that it's um, contamination. Well, there's been some recent work done on um, some dinosaur bones. And what they did, David, was they measured the carbon-14 content on the outside layer of the bone and compared it to the inside of the bone. And what they, found, what they found was more C14 inside the bone than on the outside of the bone. Now, if it was contamination, David, don't you think it would be the other way around? But this, yeah. is the, this is the interesting part, right? What they did was after they looked at numerous bones, what they found was the ratio, the ratio between C14 inside the bone to the outside bone was the same. And what they said was if you were to get one bone out of your body right now and, and measure the C14 on the outside of your bone to the inside of your bone, you will find exactly the same ratio. So that destroys the evolutionist argument of contamination. And George, you've uh, helped me as my uh, uh, colleague to think about something. If the evolutionary community is so convinced of life on Mars, that life has got to be carbon-based. Mm. Now that carbon has got to come from either the methane in the atmosphere or the CO2, then how come the rovers can't look for carbon-14 in some of the traces in these sedimentary rocks in the Vallis Marianas, the other uh, large features that the rovers are going over? So the evolutionary community would predict that there would be some carbon-14 on Mars. Is that a legitimate uh, critique, you think, uh, George? Well, there, there would have had to be uh, – obviously, there, there is some nitrogen in the atmosphere, and uh, based on the um, uh, cosmic rays that are bombarding it, you would get some of that nitrogen being converted to C14. And if there was life – if there was life – uh, a carbon-based life, it would have absorbed some of that C14 through the plants and whatever, and you would find um, C14 in that in that life. Um, but I, 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 like you, David, I don't think they'll ever find evidence of life on Mars. Yeah, yeah, and and see, for those of you that are new to the class, please understand that um, uh, George is an engineer whose worldview is based on a biblical worldview. I'm a geologist whose worldview is based on a biblical view of a young earth, a young universe, and uh, creation, not evolution. So from our viewpoint, we could have told NASA, uh, especially after the lunar missions, that uh, keep in mind that when the astronauts came back from Apollo 11, they were put in an isolation chamber. Why? Because the evolutionary scientists that ran the biological side of NASA in those days, in 69, 70, 68, they assumed there might be viruses on, on the moon, that there might be maybe even bacteria that would come back and cause a worldwide plague on Earth. And so they isolated these astronauts to make sure there wasn't a space virus. Clearly, all of the Apollo missions show that there was nothing involving life on the moon. And I believe that it will be a prediction I can make here in 2021 that if uh, the rich guys that are running things uh, with SpaceX and so forth, go an in run around NASA and land men on Mars to their own efforts, that the rocks that they bring back will be a as sterile as the rocks on the moon. So there's a, a prediction for you, Donnie. What do you think of that? 
I love and they it. Say, I love and and they ahead, they bro. say young then they say young earth creationists don't make predictions. There's one. I'll take that. Now um <laughs> the uh, Donnie, you may have other questions. I I noticed in the first hour someone had asked about the passage in Joshua about yes. the day that the earth stood still. Um I do, do can you go back to that reference in Joshua or do you want to yep, go to I've, another question? So I've got it saved here. This came in from Den. Uh he says if they use the scriptures how do they explain the Joshua 10, 13 passage, considering they believe we are spinning around the sun on a heliocentric model? Again, okay. built sun and moon together. Yeah, let me go back to Joshua. The reference is Joshua 10, what? 13. 10, 13. And so let's read what it actually says, and then we'll uh, comment on that. Joshua 10, 13 uh, says this. Um, well, let's go back to, uh, remember that one of the rules of reading the Bible is you can't take something out of its context. The a verse out of context is a pretext. So we got to be careful here. So <clears throat> in Joshua 10, 11, it says, and it came to pass as they fled from before Israel, they were going down to Beth Horon. And the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them, and they died. They were more which died with hailstones than had been killed by the sword. Now, these could be real hailstones, or they could have been a micrometeorite shower. Who knows? Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites, before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher, which is a book that nobody knows what it is, so the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down a whole day. And there was no day like that before it, before or after. I can remember as a teen, someone saying, oh, a NASA scientist has run the calendar back and he's found this long day of, um, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of Joshua. Uh, let me read you uh, a comment that Dr. Henry Morris, my mentor, wrote about this that I think is very well taken. It says the sun stood still. One trivial objection to the long day account is that the writer made a scientific mistake when he said the sun stood still. The sun does not move, it is argued. So argue, so Joshua should have told the earth to stand still instead of the sun. Uh, we know now through astronomy that the sun does move, as does every planet and so forth. Scientifically, every motion must therefore be expressed as a relative motion. And he goes on to say, thus the most scientific approach is, as the Bible says, is that the sun moves relative to the earth. Dr. Morris recognizes, and he says this, this day was unique in history the main evidence that it really happened is this historical record. And so how would I as a scientist and a Christian uh, answer this? I would answer it two ways. First of all, I have no idea, not a clue in the world, how God did it, how he could have lengthened that particular day in the history of Israel. But secondly, since one of the fundamental principles that I follow is the parts of the Bible that I can understand where I have seen in my life and the life of others, miracles occur. I believe uh, that there are miracles uh, in the words of the old uh, hymn. Uh, I don't know how God is big enough to rule the mighty universe and yet small enough to live in my heart. 
but I, I know from my own personal experience that he does live in my heart, that he has performed miracles in the lives of my children and my friends that I've seen. And so from my experiential side of life, I have no problem in believing in Joshua's long day. Donnie, uh, George, you want to add to that? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I mean, the Bible talks of, uh, about a lot of things that you can't explain, like um, Jesus coming from the dead. You know, I mean, exactly. right. does that happen? Does that happen every day? Do, do, do we do we abandon Christianity just because we we don't see? Um, but there were witnesses to to, to that effect, and, um, and and conversely, if we reverse if we reverse that argument, there's a lot of things that uh, secular scientists can't explain either. You know, explain how matter and energy can be created from nothing. Yes, you know, exactly. Come on, that's a miracle. Yeah. Let's a miracle. let's pick our miracles. Uh, 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 Donnie, uh, if I may summarize for five minutes, uh, we're at the two-hour mark, and I'm about to run out of steam here. Let me summarize and then turn it over to you two to close. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. I want to say I want to give you guys compliments. This has been a fantastic presentation. So much good information. And I just looked at the clock uh, when you said it's been two hours, and wow, two hours really flies by. So I appreciate it, and the floor is yours, uh, Professor McQueen. Okay. How would I summarize what we've gone on, what we've gone through tonight? Um, the geology of Mars, as we understand it, shows the fascinating complexity that God has put in our solar system. It shows how the basic mineralogy of Earth, the moon, and Mars, the three areas that we have objective data about, it shows how the mineralogy is based around uh, silicate minerals in metamorphic rocks and in um, uh, igneous rocks. Some of the data that George outlined from NASA scientists, for example, the, the claim that because the metamorphic grade from their orbiting units and also the rovers apparently indicate that it's low grade metamorphism. Why in the world they would say that that is evidence that there was not never plate tectonics on Mars. I, I don't know. So I don't immediately accept every conclusion that the astrogeology group at uh, the jet propulsion lab NASA has come up with, but I will uh, tell you that as a Christian scientist, I am fascinated by data. And were I given the privilege to go with George to the uh, governmental uh, units in uh, uh, Australia or to go with Donnie to the governmental units in uh, Canada, I would suggest to these bodies that we continue to fund space exploration. Why? Because God has... Uh, allowed us to have minds that uh, can explore the universe. The Discovery In Institute has a, a, a very good argument that, um, by the way, thank you, Jackson. I, too, am. Um, uh, it's interesting that you live in Louisiana, too. That's good. We'll have to get together and eat crawfish together. But at any rate, back to my point. Uh, my point is that because the Discovery Institute has made such a good argument that ours is the only planet in the solar system that would allow a true solar eclipse so that we can study from that solar eclipse, the data that shows the uh, evidence for or against some of Einstein's ideas. And so it's obvious that God made our universe and made our earth to be focused on man and for man to be able to understand things. 
the philosophers call this anthropomorphism and many critics of Christianity say, oh, how arrogant you Christians are thinking that God created the earth specially for you when we know probability shows us that there must have once been life on Mars and surely there are planets that are habitable outside of our solar system. Well, I disagree with that argument. I think the more that we study the planet Mars, the more that we do research and look into uh, the planet Mars, the better off we are. Again, don't misunderstand my critical comments about von Braun and about uh, uh, how NASA is funded. It has nothing to do with... Uh, the good things that NASA has done. The hero worship of Von Braun I worry about because when I was a boy, I thought the man was pure as the driven snow until it dawned on me that the first rocket he ever designed, he designed for the Nazis to hit London, not the moon. And so in my youth, I was told, oh, Von Braun, brought with him all this V2 technology so that we could go to the moon. Well, he did bring a lot of technology with him, and he is one of the uh, very important scientists that was taken out of Nazi Germany, and his uh, participation in the SS was uh, covered over by, Nazi, by uh, NASA uh, over the years. And so it's taken me 40 years worth of research to find out, you know, Von Braun, when asked at parties, would say, oh, I had to be part of the SS because my hobby was hunting, and I couldn't go to a hunting camp unless I was part of the SS. You know, this is a bunch of uh, cover-up in my mind. So I hope you see the balance I'm trying to find between an, an honest view of what NASA, NASA has done well and a worry about the evolutionary domination of NASA's viewpoint. Thank you for the opportunity to <clears throat> summarize. Uh, I'll let my two colleagues here react to what I said, and then I will uh, end my time. Yep, uh, I concur with that, David, and um, I'll, I'll just add uh, Proverbs 25.2 to that. Uh, which says um, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Excellent verse. Amen. Thank you and, for reading and, that. And really, modern modern science is based exactly on that and some other verses uh, in the Bible. Yeah. Prove all things, hold fast that as, which is good. As, so, Newton, himself, as Newton himself said, uh, we're thinking God's thoughts after him. Yeah, uh, Donnie, what's uh, your reaction to my comment? As always, I think uh, fantastic points, fantastic presentation, uh, great comments. Um, everybody in the chat as well. I mean, we've had a great chat the entire night. You guys kept everybody's attention. We've had a ton of great support and great questions. Uh, so well said, Professor McQueen. I, I fully agree with you. And I, uh, I am preparing for our next uh, presentation, George. Uh, in this cycle, but I'm also looking forward to the 17th, which is not that far away, for my debate uh, on the usefulness of Noah's Ark in preserving two of each kind. With that, I'll say good night to you guys and ask you to drop my video, don't, please. Don't you want to hear my joke, David? No, <laughs> please. I've, got, I've actually got one for you. Go ahead. You go first. <laughs> Okay, so so I saw an old dude, right? This is this is for the youngies. I saw an yeah. old dude with a fishing rod outside my local bar fishing in a puddle. Is that he looked, so? He, he looked so cold, David. I, I said to him, come in for a drink and get warm. As we sipped our double whiskies, not single but double whiskies, I thought I would humour him. I asked him, how many have you caught today? He replied, you are the eighth. Ha, ah, that's true. <laughs> Naivete. So my two jokes are for you, Donnie. Uh, 
cheerleaders are very prominent in uh, U.S. football games. Um, what is the favorite color of a cheerleader? That would be yellow. Yell the yell yellow. Oh, yellow. <laughs> okay, now, what is the favorite breakfast cereal of a cheerleader? That mm. would be Cheerio. Ah, uh, Cheerio. If you gave me enough time, I think I might have oh, been able to. I know you could have done it. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Goodbye. See you I later, David. Like Actually, before I allow you to leave, uh, Professor McQueen, okay. one verse I wanted to bring up that uh, came to mind, especially during the, this last few minutes, is I believe it's 2 Corinthians 10.5. In the King James Bible, it says, casting down imaginations. In other yeah. versions, it says, uh, destroying arguments, right? And yeah. every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So here on this channel, we do our best to address and refute arguments against the God that we serve, against the Bible that, that we hold. And uh, true thank to you for your leadership in this, Donnie. I appreciate that. I With appreciate that compliment it. to both of you, I will leave the studio as soon as I get my cursor to work here. Goodbye, friends. Goodbye, See Professor you, McQueen. Bye. God bless. So that being said, another one in the books. Uh, Doki Doki, I appreciate the support, the super sticker. Uh, you guys are the life and blood of this channel again. Uh, we've had a great, well, I guess this is the start of the week, but uh, last week was a great week. Again, I want to thank everybody for all their support uh, in terms of raising enough uh money uh for the campaign that we did the other day you know it really showed it really is a blessing and a motivation and an encouragement to see this community filled packed with brothers and sisters come together um and as i always say that's why we're a team it's not a one person uh, effort here right this is a team including everybody in the chat all our supporters and uh to support can be something as as small as just sharing around the content hitting the like button so again, God bless you all. Thank you all for uh, being here. We've got a great week uh, set for everybody. Um, this Thursday, like I said, Joe Hubbard and Sam Jenkins are going to be here. Uh, we got some great debates set, some great lectures. George, welcome back, brother. I was just thanking everybody for coming together last week uh, in support for the campaign. Great effort. That great effort. Great together, effort. So. That was, yeah, that was yeah. extremely encouraging. So, uh, a bit of echo, is it? I, I, I accidentally um, pulled the um, sp the uh, earphone cable off, and um, that's why I was disconnected. But Donny, I, I, just one thing. Um, one of the things that I keep hearing from um, atheists and evolutionists is, um, you know, why didn't God tell us how He did it in the Bible? I mean. In, if, if God intended to tell us everything, every fine detail of how he did it, explained everything, what would there be left for us to do? Right. Isn't it better to explore and experiment and find out how to build multi-story buildings and aeroplanes and stuff like that? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, wonderful, it's a wonderful life, you know, to, to explore yourself rather than – Someone saying, "Don't worry about it. I'll show you how how it was done." I I think that's a waste of time. Amen, amen. And um, I can't remember exactly where it is. I was trying to find it, but I believe Jesus said, "You know, if he were to tell us, if if we were to be given every single detail, right? I mean, could you imagine the size of of the Bible? I mean, it would, <laughs> it would be impossible to have every yeah. single detail. That's just talking about Jesus's ministry. Could you imagine every single detail when it comes to the creation, the pre-flood world, <laughs> the flood itself, the immediate post-flood world? No, of course not. I mean, the Bible, the way it is now, most people can't even read through, especially the skeptics, right? The skeptics like to um, put forth these arguments, but... Uh, I think most of them probably haven't even gotten through the Gospels, okay? So, but but now they want more details in the book that they haven't even read once in, in the first place. So the point is, and, and also what you pointed out, George, a great point is we it gives us more to discover. And we yeah. point out here on Standing for Truth that the, the Bible claims to be the history book of the universe. So we can actually make predictions, retrodictions from that starting point, especially from the starting point of Genesis as being the true history of the universe. And guess what? 
we discover more and more things every single day <laughs> that confirm the validity of of Genesis. So um, I mean, it, it's a great time to be a young earth creationist, George. And it's the discovery, the investigation, the research, the study that is really just so fun. Isn't that right, George? I, I, exactly. And I'll just reiterate what I said earlier. Keep, keep an eye out for a, a very short video that um, Raw Matt will pull, put out about the carbon-14 contamination issue that just just destroys that argument completely. Uh, hopefully, hopefully Matt Matt will put it up uh, today sometime, and um, you, you'd be amazed at uh, some of the work that uh, not only creationists but if, even secular scientists themselves are doing to actually disprove their own narrative. Amen, amen, brother. Um, all right. Well, uh, that being said, uh, actually, one other thing that came to mind on Matt's channel, we just uploaded a couple hours ago the uh, teaser trailer for a uh, film we're working on called Demolishing Dawkins that we're hoping to have out to everybody sometime in early 2022. So that's just one uh, teaser. That's just one um, kind of idea into some of the things that we are currently working on. So definitely check that out. And again, George, great job. Great work. You're a blessing, brother. Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm really considering that promotion you've been seeking for <laughs> <laughs> the last several months. And uh, hopefully that that uh, award, you know, the um, award for Don being Donny, Donny, I, I, I can't go above CEO. I'm already there. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> you are already at the highest. Yeah. <laughs> You're higher than me now. <laughs> um, All right. Uh, last I'm minute. I'm going to go have some now. lunch. Yes, go have, have some, some lunch. lunch. Uh, say hi to that dog of yours for me. God yeah. bless you, George. God bless everybody in the chat. Standing for Truth is out. Out. Out.